There have never been more polymaths on the planet than right now, and I compliment you on wanting to become one yourself. Polymathy is the epitome of intellectual versatility, not for showing off, but for the sheer pleasure of enjoying mental dexterity across multiple disciplines. Now, who am I to tell you about becoming a polymath? Well, I run the Magnetic Mary Method website for one thing, which has involved multiple skill sets. I got a PhD, I got two MAs to top off my BA, I got multiple certificates, past language learning exams, actually speak those languages. And from my perspective, there are some serious misconceptions about how to define polymathy. When your definition is wrong, it's impossible to reach the goal. So we're gonna define what a polymath is, look at some examples, and make sure that you can quickly craft the perfect path to being an autodidact polymath yourself. This is Dr. Anthony Metivier from magneticmemorymethod.com. You know, many people focus on the Renaissance when looking for examples of well-rounded learners, and typically you hear about figures like da Vinci and Michelangelo as having set the stage for polymathy in our age. Even in the memory improvement world, we tend to focus on Renaissance figures like Giordano Bruno and Matteo Ricci. And, you know, that's cool. That's cool. But it's also appeared in ancient India. It's appeared in ancient China. It's appeared all over the world. And people have mastered multiple topics, expanded their linguistic intelligence, and rapidly learned new skills as long as there's been humans, right? So one of the things that you can start with is just asking a simple question. Why not you? Ultimately, it's about how you behave. And there are many people making themselves polymaths by following simple steps, but they're not doing it willy-nilly. They're following procedures that have been followed by people who learn multiple topics, and you can do it too. And the key behaviors to look for and model yourself after are getting subscribed to this channel, of course, if you aren't already, hitting that thumbs up, and supporting people who want to help you. So not just my channel, but anybody who's doing good work in teaching you to learn how to learn and reminding you to keep learning how to learn because this adventure never ends. Be part of it. Take action. It is a huge part of being successful as a learner. It's to be involved, right? And that is paired with another key behavior. Being involved has to do with also amping up your intellectual curiosity. Now, some people say that curiosity has to be naturally present. You just have to have it. I disagree. There are a lot of things where I'm kind of arrogant and I don't like it about myself, but I have learned to put the brakes on it a lot of the time and then get curious. You can call it manufactured curiosity if you like, but it really helps when you're inclined towards exploring different topics when you can understand and exercise the subconscious mind that is stopping you from being curious. And you can boost your interest in even the most boring topics. And you really just have to stop yourself and start saying, yes, I'm interested in this, or tell me more, or reading things that you think you already know again, right? And you've got to do it again and again, because the more you think you know, the more unexcited you feel, the more you're probably missing the rich details and the nuances that are right in front of your face. This is a really, really important point. You've got to stimulate and sometimes simulate intellectual curiosity, even with the most quotidian information. This is key. And it's not faking it till you make it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about literally assuming that you probably don't know it as much as you think you do. And that itself should get you more curious about what you might be missing in the granular details. Now, of course, when you build up pattern recognition, this gets harder and harder to do in many areas of information. But that's when you got to double down. You also want to spend some time figuring out how you can make learning a lifestyle. Listen, there is always a place for playing brain games for relaxation and fun. But I've observed that polymaths tend to limit the amount of time they spend on such pastimes. They make learning integral to daily life, 
And when you do that, you're going to enjoy greater topic mastery. But you also want to avoid topic exhaustion. And that's where interleaving comes in. It's a very, very special technique. It's a powerful and profound technique. And we'll talk a little bit about it more later. But a subset of the learning lifestyle is time management. Now, I manage my time primarily through journaling. And I really just do a brain dump, figure out what is the most high order material that needs to get done that day. Or sometimes I use a little technique called the priority pyramid that I talk about in one of my programs. And I just create semesters for myself. I am going to learn this topic. And so I'm going to spend three months on it. And maybe I'll spend six months or nine months on it. But I think in terms of semesters. And then I take deep dives into these particular topics. For example, I've been designing games. And my game design has been going slower than I thought. But there's just so much more rich information than I thought there was to explore. And the more I explore, the more I think about games, and the better my game design gets. And it just takes time, right? So you've got to make it part of your lifestyle to fit it in. Now, and when it comes to just giving the brain a break, one of the things that I do is I do sometimes play these little games. But what I do is I listen to podcasts and I listen to audio programs and I listen to videos while that I am just getting a little bit of relief from sitting at the desk and just do 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 do. And then I'm literally not really caring that much about the game because it's just a game. But I'm really deeply focused on listening and using memory techniques sometimes to just memorize and encode in real time what people are saying. So it's not like all work, but it's trying to get as much in as possible. And the interleaving effect that we'll talk about later also helps in terms of memory formation because you can skip between different topics, spend all day reading a hard set of books in the library, for example, and then just go and read a different topic you're studying through audio and you're switching between the topics. It's just going to help your brain percolate. It's really, really powerful. Now, you also need to be thinking. And there are several types of thinking that you'll want to explore in order to really speed your journey towards being a polymath. And if you're doing it, you're essentially a polymath anyway. So it's not like there's a destination. You're not going to reach some special place. If you're going to be a polymath, you're always learning. And in order to think, read critical thinking books. On my blog, there's a list of critical thinking books that I recommend. It gets you familiar with what critical thinking is. And from there, you really just have to practice multiple forms of critical thinking. I'm talking about abstract thinking, concrete thinking, independent thinking. And basically, I would recommend learning the memory wheel technique, as I've discussed on this channel in different videos. And it's just very, very powerful to use the memory wheel, not as a memory palace, but as a means of combinatorial thinking. So one wheel that you could build if you're into critical thinking is a wheel of critical thinkers. And just using the letters of their names on the wheel, you can think, OK, so what would, you know, uh, Michael Shermer think, for example, about this problem? And that's on your M or your S, however you want to place him on your wheel. And then you would roll that wheel and think, OK, so what would Richard Dawkins' response be? And then you'd say, well, they're uh, too much in agreement. So now you're going to roll your wheel around and you're going to try to find a contrary view. And maybe, maybe you come across, I don't know, Rupert Sheldrake or someone like that. And that gives you an alternative view. Now, you don't have to agree with any of these people. And just because you might be more in the Dawkins camp and not the Sheldrake camp doesn't mean that you would dismiss how that the person that someone on your wheel dismisses those things. No, you would actually go through it, go through that potential angle. Because that's what a polymath is, is someone who understands multiple categories of thought and doesn't dismiss it, but actually thinks through it. Even if you ultimately at the end don't agree with it, you know what it is and you think through it so that you can share an experience of the possible conclusion and compare it against the one that you're more favorable to. You would also know eventually in your polymathy journey that your own biases come from memory. 
So you've got primacy effect. And some of those people that we disagree with in the world, and we can't understand why they would ever have such a different conclusion than we do, is not simply because they've logically thought it out, but they are bound through primacy effect and what is sometimes called implicit memory. And by being willing to go through what they go through in order to arrive at the thoughts that they arrive at in contrast with how the people you're more biased towards go through those thought processes, not only do you have more understanding, but you have more sympathy, more empathy, and you have more sympathy and empathy for yourself and your own conclusions, and you essentially help yourself avoid dogmatism. And it's really, really important. When I was a university student, there were so many people who were terrified to study the opposing party and so forth because they would be lambasted for even mentioning them. That's not a place that we want to wind up in, in our world. We want to be able to tear into as many topics as possible and essentially have debates with each other, but have them in a way that is fair so that we're not just beating other people up. Now, Speaking of beating people up, when I was at university, I also remember students who were terrified to take a topic like law because at that time, digital books were not very common and there were barely even forums on the internet. And in the law libraries, there were people who tore pages out of textbooks in order to prevent other people from beating them at exams. Now, that's not that much of a problem these days because there are digital books and so forth. But one thing that a polymath needs to remember, and it's why I'm thinking of this example, is that information that's freely available or easier to get on the internet doesn't mean you can get away with skimming or scanning those books. You have to engage with the information substantively, no matter how much it costs or what format it comes in, and you need to know thyself. So if you've noticed that digital books don't serve you, then you need to go to those physical libraries. And if you find in those physical libraries that pages have been torn out, then you need to alert the librarian and ask them to get it replaced. You know, you've got to be engaged in the community, which is the appeal that I gave to you at the beginning, to hit that thumbs up, be subscribed to this channel if you aren't already, because there are so many things that go on in the world and we need libraries. We need them more than ever before and people just don't say anything. You need to be in communication. And those libraries, they are filled with people who could become your best friend, your best asset, your best ally, because when you've got a question, they will be able to help you. It's, it's not easy to use some of these search strings, uh, Boolean and all that. I mean, I, I trained as a librarian. I've worked in three libraries, and I've got a certificate in the data science for becoming a professional librarian. I never pursued that career in the end, but I studied it, and it can be a lot. It, it was a lot to wrap my head around back then, and it's gotten even more complicated with the internet now. But librarians are incredibly useful people to have on your side. So get into physical books, because a lot of us, we're not learning as much as we could because we are going for convenience with digital books and so forth, and it's just not working out for a lot of people. Now, if that's not the case for you, then you know, your mileage is going to vary. But I find that I need physical books. I'm just not getting as much out of digital as I do from physical. And it is a greater investment. There's no two ways about it. And you have to wait sometimes for books to come through interlibrary loan and all that sort of stuff. But if you schedule your time optimally, well, then you're going to have things to do while you're waiting. Now, another thing that you need to do is be interconnected. Back when I was an undergrad, and I was in grad school as well, the students I was with, we went out of our way to organize study groups. We always had to show up at a particular time, a particular place, and if we couldn't be there, the best we had was the memory of other students, or sometimes the notes. And some of those people didn't have very effective note-taking strategies. I still think that's a great thing to do if you can. Study books with other people, study topics with other people, meet with them in meet space, in real cafes, real meeting rooms in libraries, interact with them. But also these days, you can interact with so many people on a variety of forums. You can join live tutorials via Zoom. And if you can't be there live, you can watch the replays. Many people hosting live sessions will take questions in advance and cover them during the sessions. And that way you get your questions answered 
after the fact, and sometimes they'll get to you even before the live session and give you that answer before the fact. But you have to be engaged. Don't let questions go unanswered in your head. Seek out connection and communicate. And the more you're involved with the more learners that are out there, the more you're going to get multiple angles. And it is very, very powerful to be interconnected. Now, this is going to be a bit controversial, but multitasking, I think, actually gets a bad name a lot of the time. There are exceptions to the rule. I mentioned one of them. I only do it a couple hours a week, but I listen to podcasts while playing very simple games for a little bit of light, but it lets me keep the emphasis on my learning goals while physically resting, letting part of my brain do a couple of things, and it's just very, very good, and it is multitasking. But multitasking is also something that you can practice with memory techniques. So for example, when I go and memorize the names of 30, 40, 50 people in a room, I am definitely multitasking because I am taking the incoming information of the name that I don't know, and I'm using recall rehearsal to get the names that have just come in into long-term memory so I can hold them longer, set the basis for holding them for years if that's what I want to do, but definitely hold them long enough to use their names in the demonstration and then throughout the presentation that I'm about to give about memory techniques. And I'm also managing little small talk points that people have said during you know, the opening of the meeting or even as they're introducing themselves, they'll say their, their career or they'll talk about a partner or so on. I mean, just as an example, I remember memorizing a, a row of names. There was Alan and then there was Sharon. Edward, Edward said he was sitting in for Angela. You know, like I memorize all that stuff. I have to multitask in order to do that. And also when I'm reading, I have tons of ideas that are coming in all the time for books that I'm writing. That's a kind of multitasking. So I can memorize in real time what those ideas are. Although sometimes I just take notes and it really just does not harm at all to have this kind of switching on, switching off. There's a thing called cognitive switching and there's a thing called task switching. And if you actually practice being able to switch between tasks, it is possible that you actually strengthen your brain instead of weakening it. And in order to practice task switching, you need some level of multitasking. So this idea of focusing on one thing and only one thing, it may have truth for some people, but I think for people who want to become polymaths, you're going to really want to make sure that you're practicing some level of task switching to strengthen your ability to do that. Now, in the memory world and the world of overall mental dexterity, there is a person named Harry Kane. He made a course called the Multiple Mentality Course. I have a post about that on my blog, which you can search up, Harry Kane, Multiple Mentality and MagneticMaryMethod.com if you want to learn more about that. Eventually, maybe I'll make a video about that. Let me know in the comments if you would like to see that sooner than later. Now, let's talk about other aspects here about being a polymath. David Perrell, he has been on the podcast. He talks about learning in public. This is, I think, very, very useful, and it can help you practice some multitasking in a way that is positive. And, you know, there's a lot of technical learning and work involved in learning in public, but that's what I've been doing since I started this back in 2012. And it has to do with being able to take the skill set of teaching, writing, creating audio, creating video, having some level of performance. I know I'm not the best speaker in the world. I know I'm not the best writer in the world, but I'm constantly rotating through these skills and I'm doing it in public. And the cool thing about the internet, I, I do believe physical books are superior in the end, but the cool thing about online digital information is that just about everything is in beta. I wish that YouTube would allow you to just insert a new video in the same shell, so to speak, of a video because there are sometimes times when I would like to actually improve them, but they're not in beta on YouTube. You have to just create a new video or edit a video and then have it show up again as a new video. So that's um, a little bit of an issue there, but the benefit of it is, is that you're learning in public. You're making those mistakes in public. You're getting the feedback. And when that feedback is charitable, well, it's very, very useful. And sometimes the uncharitable feedback is useful as well. But 
I'm mentioning this because if you want to be a polymath, one of the best things you can do in today's world is start your own blog, start your own podcast, invite as many guests as you want to learn from, and just enjoy the information wealth that comes into your life. And you will be learning in public how to use multiple tools. So you're exchanging coaching and mentorship in exchange for a bit of publicity that you give to your guests while you're teaching yourself how to use the internet and while you're teaching yourself how to be social in this new world of the internet and you're just becoming better and better and better and you can match all of this with the great memory tradition and remember everything that you need to know in order to pull it all off much, much faster. So I encourage you to get into the key memory techniques. These are the memory palace system, ideally a memory palace network, which means multiple memory palaces. I teach you how to do that at magneticmerrymethod.com. The major system, build out your major system to a 00 to 99 PAO. Learn to do some mind mapping for the very specific outcomes where mind mapping is useful. Learn proper spaced repetition because mind mapping and memory palaces can help you absolutely optimize the benefits of learning faster and remembering more. You can spend a weekend on learning all of these techniques, get the bird's eye view, and then it's just practice from then on in with mnemonic devices to keep yourself sharp, but you need deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is one of the biggest things for polymaths to know what it is, to be able to experience it consistently, and to do it in a way that is charted, that is documented, so you can study your progress. So deliberate practice means different things in different areas of knowledge and skill, but just understand that it can't be random. It can't just be conceptual in your mind. It has to be somehow documented, whatever it is that you're trying to do. In music, for example, the way I approach deliberate practice is very similar to the way that I tidy up certain things in language learning. I'm not the best speaker in different languages. I don't have the best pronunciation skills, but one of the ways that I work on it is through this deliberate practice. So in music and in language learning, it's basically the same thing. If you're learning a piece of music and you keep getting hung up on a particular passage, rather than going back to the beginning of the song, deliberate practice would have you loop that one little passage in the song. Then you add that passage with the next bar, and then you loop that. Then you add the bar before the problematic passage, and you loop the previous bar with the problematic bar, and then you go and loop all three. Then you go back to the beginning of the song. In language learning, same thing. Let's say your pronunciation of a word is in the middle of the sentence. Well, instead of just constantly going back to the beginning of the sentence, you work on just that little part of the sentence. Then you do that word and the word after it. Then that word and the word before it. Loop them. Then you do all three words. Loop them. Then you go back to the beginning of the sentence. You can do this with philosophy. Let's say you don't understand what the heck pure imminence is. Well, you've read this one book. Now you read the next book you discover that actually pure eminence used to be called something else. So then you go back and read a book that's earlier than the book that you just read. And then you try and work with all three books in your mind to work it out. And then you get what Ezra Pound called the luminous detail. Something about these things finally projects almost holographically an understanding. That information isn't in this book. It's not in this book and it's not in that book, but your understanding of it comes holographically, so to speak, from all three of them being pressed together, percolated together through your mind. This is balance, this is depth, and it is breadth. And this is how you become a polymath in multiple topics. And ultimately, that word autodidact, having taught yourself, frankly, that has to go. You have to engage with other experts. This is really, really important because an expert is someone who knows a lot, but they know their limitations. And they know that what they know was always done in collaboration with others. Even if you never met that person and you only read the books that they wrote thousands of years ago, you are tapping into 
their resources and you're leveraging what they left behind for you. And you can't just focus on the past. You also have to focus on the future. Build your community. Build your audience. And why would you become a polymath in the first place if you weren't going to share what you're learning? Experiment with that part above all. Document your learning journey publicly. Share it. It's never been easier now. And this may not continue to be as easy as it is. So call a spade a spade. The more you experiment now, not waiting for tomorrow, not waiting for someday, the more you're going to get to learn now. Learning is about now, now, and now yet again. And you'll make mistakes, but these downfalls are opportunities for analytical thinking. This is so important because you need to be objective. And in order to produce that objectivity, you need deliberate practice. You need this, this, and this. You know, the first thing, and then the second thing, and you need to loop those things, and then you need to go back and make another loop, and then you need to loop all three pieces together in order to create a luminous detail. I've had this. I, I wrote a book called Flyboy. It's the first memory detective novel. It was an experiment. And as part of launching the book, I had to design the book. I got great help from Rob, who's often on our live video launches. He's helped so much. You have no idea. Thank you so much, Rob. But he helped design that book. And then we tested it with releasing it with a live action memory game. There were little mistakes along the way. Even my ego made mistakes. Oh, that ego. I wish it would go away. But <laughs> you know, we managed. We learned. We used deliberate practice with the ego each and every time. We had these unexpected results, and they were an opportunity to analyze, to think rationally about what to do next. I learned a lot about games. I learned even more about novels, and then I got the idea of making kids' books, like The Mystery of the Magnetic Numbers. These things were luminous details that never would have revealed themselves to me without experimentation, without putting it into action, without getting feedback from people out in the world. No experimentation, no new learning. Add a new area of expertise to your polymath profile, so to speak, as much as you can and do it with an audience because they will help you so much. It's unbelievable the kind of help that you get when you don't be an autodidact and try to do it on your own. You need to collaborate. So set some goals, organize your time, do it publicly to build a community that can help encourage you, build a bit of a thick skin because there's going to be people out there who just want to break things down, but then add that to your deliberate practice too. Practice how you respond to that. Practice how you deal with your feelings about it. It's never just about learning and memorizing facts when you want to be a polymath. Never. It can't be. But if there is one thing to constantly study and practice and learn from your practice, it's memory. Memory is the most massive lever you will ever find. I could be wrong about that, but if you want to find out for yourself, arrive at your own conclusion, go to magneticmerrymethod.com, get involved. It's not only going to give you new skills, but it's going to introduce you to an entire area where you can explore all the topics you love, history, critical thinking, the biographies of so many incredibly fascinating people who used memory techniques. And let me just revisit a very, very important point. When you become a polymath, you literally are making your own university. And I'll give you a personal story. When I was in grad school, my supervisor gave me the talk near the end of my degree. I was so excited that I'd finished my field exams, I'd finished writing my dissertation, it had been accepted and all I had left to go was the final defense. So my supervisor and I, we were walking down Bay Street in Toronto. And he told me all about how bad the job market had become over the years. He said, even if you publish a dozen academic books, you would still struggle to get a job on the tenure track at a university. Now, by that time, I'd already learned how to learn so many different topics that I turned to him with a clear and focused confidence in my voice. I said, if it comes down to it, I'll build my own university. I actually swore when I said it then, but I will... Uh, Keep it family friendly for now. The long story short is that that's exactly what wound up happening. I created magneticmerrymethod.com, which is a university focused on memory 
and as many things connected to memory as I can possibly imagine. It has multiple departments, like the upcoming critical thinking course, Beyond Sherlock, which you can get advance notice for at magneticmerrymethod.com forward slash BY. It was only possible to do all these things by thinking and then most importantly, acting like a polymath. I know that you can do it too. Maybe you don't want to build your own university, but in a way, symbolically, that is what you're doing. And it is a beautiful thing because university has the word universe in it. And isn't that what we all kind of want? Let's be honest. We all want to be like a god in the universe of our mind. So put the strategies we've discussed today into action. Do what it takes to become the architect of your dreams. And you know, you got battles with your ego, so you don't have to be the god in the university of your mind. But no matter how that you structure that metaphor for you, polymathy is the path.